someone. Like, you know, but like, I feel like in the like, area of like, all one person, and like, one party has some of that in the line, and then the other party has like, a lot of that in the future. No, no, it means like a big No, that's not an option. Yeah, because liberals have, because the liberals want it all down there, yeah. and most of that comes with the person. So, yeah, so it really makes sense. Uh, and also, Some random vote from that person, and you should be community yeah, leaders, yeah, you know? Yeah. So if, you, if you're part of that person, you've probably met them before, you've probably talked to them, you might just say, I think policy should be more important. Well, I mean, it makes sense because, like, because, like, if you know them, you know, and, and like, usually it's the community leaders who run, you know? So, uh, it makes sense to, like, because, like, if you know them personally, and, like, yeah, like, if you know them personally, and, like, if you know them that well as well, like, no, I just need time to be a first attempt at this. Are you in the past? So, we're going to study two things. Like, you know, those two official things are outside the camera. Yeah, first one going on. I didn't buy any books for it. I just did it, of course. So my course was pretty expensive, it was like $50, so I think $1,500. Oh, $1,500. So like I, I would now want to be buying it. I would spend how much money I would have. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. They didn't like, teach from a book or anything? They do, they, they oh. give you books, but they, they gave me a thing. Oh, so the book is basically included. But it's your own book, like it's a course book. Oh, I see. I see. But, he, but I think like, a lot of it's like paraphrase slash plagiarized from like other big names. Yeah, there's, 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 there's only so many ways to write the outside, so it's like it's... But the guy who uh, teaches it, right? Yeah. He runs like the school. He's got a 179, I think. Okay, well. So he's on the 99.9% of the So I trust him more than some guys who are the Because, like, you know, like, when we went to our law school, like, you know, we're really hard to do. Like, you go to, like, that presentation by law school, uh, like, by reps. I'm not going to see all of them, but I know one woman mentioned, I think she was from, I thought the school, it was, it was like a woman from like a neighboring school. She mentioned, she's like, oh, I'm glad I never had one book either. So I'm like, it's a younger law school, I'm really young guys. So I'm like, it's just weird. They're basically just like sales reps, and they're like, it's not too so far. So, you know, it's because it's actually done to that. And I think for like, for sports, you know, it's probably the same thing. Is it also changes every year? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Before I begin today's lecture, let me briefly see if there's any quick questions or comments about anything that, uh, that we've covered thus far or anything else related to the class. Uh, if not, uh, then before we get into uh, today's uh, uh, topics, I uh, just wanted to touch on a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, as uh, some of you probably know, uh, the World Health Organization has now declared the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, an um, international uh, health emergency. Uh, and while that's not uh, within the uh, realm of our uh, subject for this course, uh, it is worth mentioning uh, that it will have some drastic impacts uh, on uh, global politics uh, and uh, on uh, the global economy in particular, uh, depending on how, how all of this shakes out. Uh, it's interesting to note in that regard uh, that while there were heavy criticisms uh, of the Chinese uh, government uh, in uh, the SARS epidemic uh, of 2002, uh, for their slow response and their secretiveness about uh, what exactly was going on. Uh, the World Health Organization on this occasion uh, praised the Chinese government for its rapid response, um, which uh, was indeed rather rapid and is hard to imagine uh, could have been possible uh, on the scale that took place in China in almost any other context. Uh, in other words, uh, the authoritarianism of the Chinese uh, state in this case uh, led to a far more efficient uh, reaction uh, to the problem uh, than probably would have could have been imagined in most other uh, places. Um, that said, uh, it's nonetheless a worrisome uh, 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 situation uh, in that uh, the uh, drastic action taken by the Chinese uh, certainly indicate uh, that their, impre uh, that their uh, impression is that this is a very dangerous uh, outbreak uh, and uh, uh, something to be taken seriously. Uh, and uh, indeed, there's considerable uh, reasons for that, uh, for uh, that position. Um, the SARS outbreak, uh, according to uh, some of the figures that I've read, uh, had a um, infectious infection rate uh, where uh, each individual that uh, was infected uh, infected uh, slightly less than one other person on average. Uh, in uh, the SARS outbreak, pardon me, in the, in the outbreak of coronavirus this time around, uh, the, uh, the uh, findings uh, seem to indicate that each individual infected person is infecting between two and four others. Uh, in other words, it's quite a bit more infectious uh, than SARS was. Um, SARS was fairly quickly contained, uh, but one of the things that makes this rather worrisome is that um, one of the reasons why SARS was pretty, fairly quickly contained is because China was still relatively contained in 2002 when compared to today. Uh, so uh, at the time, uh, the New York Times reported today uh, that uh, there were f uh, 400 uh, different uh, flight routes out of, uh, out of China uh, in um, uh, 2002. Uh, at this point, uh, the number of flights uh, departing from China has increased by almost 24. Uh, meaning uh, that it's going to be considerably more difficult to contain uh, this outbreak uh, than was last time around. Um, the only thing that's somewhat hopeful about this uh, is that the lethality of uh, this infection uh, seems to be quite a bit lower uh, than SARS uh, or uh, the MERS uh, uh, virus that emerged a couple of years later. Uh, uh, and uh, in that regard, we're still not entirely sure what, uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, one of the things that seems, still seems to be unknown uh, is exactly how long the incubation period uh, of the disease is uh, and how soon it can be spread from one person to another after somebody is infected but before they show uh, symptoms, although apparently they can spread it before they actually show symptoms. Um, and uh, to a certain extent, it's always uh, uh, a little bit difficult uh, to anticipate these kinds of, uh, the, how these things are going to play out. Uh, for one thing, because uh, when diseases like this first show up, they show, first show up in hospitals. Uh, and when they first test for them, they come, uh, can come across those that show up in hospitals. And you wouldn't show up in hospitals unless you had really bad symptoms. Uh, and uh, uh, consequently, it's rather difficult to gauge how many people that are infected, act, ex infected actually get those bad symptoms and how many people have no symptoms at all or only a mild illness and so on. Uh, and the result of that is that in the early stages, often the lethality of these kinds of diseases is uh, vastly overstated uh, because um, it's based on those people that are, uh, that are confirmed cases and those are the ones that show up in hospital and doesn't necessarily include those that may have gotten the infection but not had any, uh, any negative results. A uh, good um, illustration of that uh, was the West Nile, uh, Nile virus. Uh, I don't know what you guys recall uh, the West Nile virus, but it was a big scare uh, 
uh, when it showed up in a few people, a few cases, uh, uh, in, um, and uh, a few people died from it. Uh, but then, all of a sudden, then a few months later, uh, physicians started finding um, that when they were taking blood tests, all sorts of people showed up with positive for respiratory virus that never reported getting any illness or even being aware that they had anything wrong with them. Uh, in, in the meantime, West Nile virus is no longer considered uh, much of a threat at all. Uh, so the coronavirus might well go down this road uh, and, uh, find, uh, and turn out to be much less uh, problematic than it at the moment seems. Uh, but uh, it's obvious that the Chinese are rather worried about it. And, it's, uh, and to get to our topic, topic today, uh, it's obvious that the Russians are rather worried about it because they announced today that they were shutting down the 2,600 mile uh, border between Ch uh, Russia and China uh, and shutting down all trains that cross through it uh, and all plane traffic with the exception of one train that is allowed uh, through from Beijing uh, to Moscow, uh, presumably to get uh, Russian uh, citizens out of the country or something along those lines. Um, anyway, we'll have to keep our eye on that and see, see how it uh, develops uh, as we move on. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to briefly mention before we get back into our, um, our uh, case study of uh, Russia uh, is uh, uh, a major foreign policy announcement that was made uh, this week uh, by the United States uh, uh, with respect uh, to the Middle East, uh, what uh, the Trump administration described as the deal of the century uh, that it had announced uh, before he even became president uh, and had assigned uh, his son-in-law, uh, Jared Kushner, uh, to be the point man on uh, to design uh, this deal of the century that would finally bring peace uh, to, and uh, tranquility uh, to the Middle East. Uh, as some of you are probably aware, uh, it was announced on Monday uh, by Donald Trump, uh, flanked by a beaming uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, who couldn't con practically couldn't contain his joy uh, at uh, uh, what was going on, uh, and uh, loudly announced that this was f that this demonstrated that uh, Donald Trump was the cl best friend that uh, Israel ever had in the White House. Uh, and that he was finally willing to um, you know, bring to an end uh, the absurd uh, description uh, of uh, the West Bank settlements as illegal, uh, although they are illegal uh, under international law, remain illegal under international law. It's not Donald Trump that writes international law. It's certainly not Bibi Netanyahu that writes international law. Uh, and uh, international law is based on the idea uh, that any, uh, any uh, territory captured uh, by um, military um, means uh, is illegitimate. And furthermore, that uh, you know, territory that is uh, captured by um, military means does not uh, uh, permit uh, the occupying power uh, to displace the local population uh, and to replace it with their own citizens. Uh, in that regard, uh, there is absolutely no ambiguity uh, in international law about the legal status uh, of uh, the uh, settlements in the West Bank. Um, it's also interesting to note uh, that this deal of the century, or the peace deal, uh, as it was call called, was announced uh, without the presence of one of the parties to that deal. Uh, in other words, there were no representative. Uh, there was no representative of the Palestinian Authority uh, present at the announcement, and there is no indication that the Palestinians were ever consulted uh, in the process of developing this uh, this deal. Uh, consequently, it's not too surprising uh, that this deal will go up lead, like a lead balloon. Uh, that uh, it's likely to go nowhere. Uh, and it's also uh, perhaps not uh, altogether surprising uh, that uh, since uh, um, both of those that announced it uh, find themselves in trouble, uh, one is accused of being uh, of uh, fraud and uh, bribery uh, and is, uh, is likely to be um, thrown out of office for that, uh, the other is in the middle of an impeachment process. Uh, in other words, uh, that there's strong domestic reasons uh, for uh, why this announcement took place, uh, despite the fact that it has little or no hope uh, of succeeding. Um, it also, to some extent, illustrates, uh, again, the nature of the Trump administration uh, and uh, how policies form. Uh, in regard to this, uh, it is noteworthy uh, that um, Jared Kushner, uh, the son-in-law of uh, Donald Trump, uh, was the point man that uh, created this uh, formula. Uh, Jared Kushner has no background in international law or international relations whatsoever. Uh, his background is as a real estate developer. And even his background as a real estate developer should be seen with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, he became a real estate developer, a very successful real estate developer, because he's the son of a very successful real estate developer. In other words, uh, he sort of is like, the, uh, like Donald Trump, uh, who was born on, the th on third base and convinced himself he hit a home run um, uh, uh, by becoming uh, successful. Uh, and uh, uh, in the case of Jared Kushner, it goes a little bit further than that. Uh, Jared Kushner's father uh, is a close family friend uh, of the Netanyahu's. Uh, and uh, whenever uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu visited the United States, 
He always stayed at the Kushner's house, and Jared Kushner always had to vacate his room in order to allow uh, 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 Bibi uh, to stay there. Uh, so uh, the family connections in that regard uh, go uh, pretty far. Um, anyway, we'll keep our eye on uh, how this uh, moves forward. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, there was a, uh, a, um, a professor, a Palestinian professor, uh, interviewed yesterday uh, in, on Democracy Now! on the subject, uh, and he had one positive thing to say about uh, this uh, development, uh, and that uh, is uh, that uh, this finally ends uh, the charade, uh, as he called it, uh, of the uh, two-state solution, uh, and uh, above all else, uh, ends uh, the uh, the charade uh, of pretending that the United States is a neutral actor in this uh, that uh, can bring about such a deal. Uh, in essence, it's been fairly evident uh, to uh, most uh, Palestinian observers uh, that the United States is by no means uh, an uh, impartial um, um, player uh, in this, uh, but rather is, uh, rather is closely committed to uh, and very much influenced uh, by uh, the uh, Israeli side in this conflict. Um, We'll leave uh, our comments at that for the time being um, and um, uh, turn our attention now uh, to uh, Russia uh, and Russian foreign policy. Uh, we began our discussion of Russian foreign policy briefly last class uh, by noting uh, the uh, consistency uh, to a certain extent uh, of uh, the foreign policies uh, adopted by Russia uh, over uh, several centuries. And one way of understanding that consist consistency uh, is uh, essentially uh, to uh, look at uh, Russian foreign policy uh, through the lens uh, of what is often described as geopolitics. Uh, geopolitics <coughs> refers to uh, the intersection of geography and, po and uh, the study of uh, political science or uh, international politics. Uh, and the key thinkers in the tradition of geopolitics, uh, as many of you are probably aware, uh, are uh, Halford Mackinder and Alfred Taylor Mahan. Uh, Halford Mackinder uh, argued uh, that uh, the key uh, to dominating the globe uh, on the basis of geopolitics is to dominate the Eurasian heartland, is to dominate the Eurasian heartland. Because whatever power dominates the Eurasian heartland, uh, is ideally placed uh, to push their influence outward uh, to gain complete control uh, of the Eurasian continent. And once they have done so, they effectively control uh, the vast majority of the human populations on the planet and the vast majority of resources on the planet. And consequently, gaining greater control uh, of uh, uh, what remains of the planet, uh, the Western Hemisphere, uh, Africa, uh, and uh, Australia, uh, becomes essentially a mopping up operation. Uh, this is a vision of geopolitics uh, that uh, prevailed uh, in particular uh, in Western countries, uh, and in particular during the Cold War, uh, and uh, motivated uh, the foreign policies uh, of uh, the United States in particular, as well as its, uh, its uh, allies uh, in NATO, uh, in that it painted a rather worrisome picture uh, of the position of the Soviet Union uh, during the uh, period of the Cold War, uh, since the heartland uh, in, uh, of the Eurasian continent uh, is occupied uh, primarily uh, by uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and furthermore, uh, since uh, it, it understood uh, the communist movement uh, as uh, a movement centered in Moscow. Uh, it viewed the Chinese Revolution as essentially uh, a verification uh, of uh, this overall picture of the Soviet Union slowly pushing its influence outward, uh, gaining control of the vast majority of the citizens of the world, and thus becoming a menace uh, for uh, the rest of the world uh, that had to be ad absolutely contained. Uh, but from the uh, Russian perspective, what is perhaps more informative in terms of understanding their foreign policy uh, is the image that was put forward uh, by uh, Alfred, uh, by, uh, pardon me, by uh, Alfred Taylor Mahan, uh, who argued, uh, quite to the contrary, that it was not uh, the 
Eurasian heartland that was crucial uh, toward dominating uh, global politics, but rather control over the oceans, control over the oceans. And that what was crucial uh, toward controlling uh, the world's oceans uh, were controlling the majority of ports uh, in the international system. In other words, what was crucial was what uh, he termed the rimlands. surrounding the Eurasian uh, continent. Indeed, he noted uh, that insofar as a single state has uh, become a dominant player in international affairs uh, since the Roman Empire, uh, the only example that he could cite for that uh, was uh, Great Britain. Uh, and Great Britain certainly did not control uh, the heartland of the Eurasian continent, uh, but controlled the oceans, uh, and controlled the oceans uh, by uh, having colonies uh, in uh, most of the uh, regions uh, around uh, the rim uh, of uh, the Eurasian continent, as well as outside of it. Whoever controlled the oceans and the rimlands was ideally situated to expand their influence inward uh, and take control of the Eurasian heartland as a whole. And indeed, uh, historically, those that controlled the rimlands uh, were more powerful states on the peripheries of Russia uh, that uh, can, uh, can created uh, considerable fear uh, among Russian leaders uh, from the 16th uh, century onward uh, about their vulnerability, uh, whether that is Great Britain and the European powers uh, to the east, uh, Persia uh, to the south, uh, China and Japan uh, to uh, the uh, east. Uh, Russia always perceived itself as surrounded uh, on all sides by more, more powerful players, uh, with more efficient economies, and with little in the way of geographic protection uh, from those, uh, those uh, more powerful states on its periphery. And this is a theme. Uh, that runs through uh, the foreign policies of, of uh, Russian governments uh, from the seven, uh, from 1700 on. Among the lasting trends is always the need to stabilize borders against powerful neighbors to the west, south, and east. And the easiest way to bring about uh, or to uh, neutralize such threats uh, was through expansion. Into the Caucasus and Central Asia, uh, into Siberia and the Far East, Mongolia, and so on, and into the Baltics. Uh, but as I pointed out last class, uh, that has it had the invariable uh, result of creating security dilemmas. Uh, as Russia, in order to protect its borders, pushes its borders outwards, it appears more and more aggressive to its neighbors. And it has the tendency uh, to create countervailing alliances uh, against Russia. Uh, but there's other uh, components uh, of uh, this overall uh, picture uh, of uh, trying to consolidate the borders of Russia uh, by expanding them outward that have had a lasting impact uh, on Russian foreign policy. It has, above all else, uh, involved incorporating uh, non-Russian speaking uh, and ethnically non-Russian uh, peoples uh, into the Russian Federate or Russian Empire, uh, the Soviet Union, or later the Russian uh, Federation. Uh, the overall uh, result of that uh, has been uh, a lasting problem uh, for Russia uh, in the form of, of a lack of a Russian national identity. The expansion of Russian territory into non-Russian uh, regions uh, invariably involved uh, 
not too much different from uh, the uh, expansion of uh, uh, the British Empire, uh, the co-optation of, of um, uh, the elites uh, within those territories, There's the, the subjugation of non-speaking, uh, uh, non-Russian-speaking elites. Uh, but uh, leaving uh, the national identities of, of those regions uh, to some extent uh, still intact. Uh, one of the places that that can be noted uh, in particular, uh, and uh, one that is certainly relevant uh, in this respect, uh, is uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine, long before the Soviet Union, uh, was part of the Russian Empire. Uh, it was to a large extent considered the breadbasket uh, of uh, the Russian Empire. Uh, because of the fertile uh, lands um, uh, of the Ukrainian plains. Uh, but Ukraine uh, was never successfully uh, transformed into part of uh, Russia uh, in terms of identifying uh, with Russia uh, in, as a, a nationality. Uh, there's uh, complex reasons for that. Uh, some are linguistic. Uh, some relate to religion. Uh, Ukraine still has a separate language, or the Ukrainians still speak a separate language. Uh, and uh, many Ukrainians are of the Catholic persuasion, uh, rather than uh, following the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, the situation that has arisen in uh, Ukraine is uh, similar uh, to other regions uh, uh, that have long been part of uh, the Russian uh, Empire uh, and later the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation, uh, such as Georgia, uh, Chechnya, uh, and of course uh, the Central Asian republics uh, that broke away from the Soviet Union uh, after uh, the uh, collapse uh, of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, to become uh, sovereign states. We'll talk a little bit more about that lack of national, uh, national identity uh, and how uh, various governments have sought to deal with that. Uh, but uh, let me uh, turn my attention to a, a, what, uh, one other uh, component uh, of uh, the lasting trends within Russian history. And that is uh, the relative uh, economic backwardness uh, of Russia, uh, which is closely linked uh, to concerns over national security. Russia has historically uh, been uh, an economic backwater uh, in uh, respect uh, to Western Europe. Uh, and uh, that in and of itself has uh, led to uh, an ongoing uh, kind of a rift within uh, the political culture uh, of uh, Russia, uh, which has uh, alternately looked at uh, Europe uh, for uh, inspiration, uh, and on the other hand, other hand seen Europe uh, as a threat uh, to uh, Russian culture. As such, uh, it has uh, seen itself uh, alternately, uh, alternately uh, as uh, a bringer of Western culture uh, to other regions uh, of uh, Central uh, and, uh, and uh, Central Asia uh, and further uh, east, uh, or as a bulwark against the spread of uh, European decadence. Um, that sense of inferiority uh, with regard to economic development uh, is uh, something that is uh, long-lasting uh, and is evident uh, to a considerable extent uh, in uh, the writers uh, from, uh, uh, from Russia uh, dating back to the 19th uh, and uh, 18th centuries, uh, writers uh, like um, Tolstoy, 
uh, Dostoevsky uh, and uh, Herzen uh, feature uh, on many occasions uh, discussions uh, about uh, German emigres uh, and their uh, greater efficiency and the extent to which uh, Russians uh, have learned from them and so on and so forth. In that sense, there's always been somewhat of an inferiority complex with respect uh, to uh, Western Europe. Uh, but at the same time, uh, a tendency to see Western European influence as undermining uh, core uh, aspects of uh, Russian culture uh, and uh, as introducing uh, a more materialistic uh, and uh, decadent uh, kind of lifestyle uh, into, uh, into Russia. Uh, but that economic backwardness uh, has certainly been a feature uh, of uh, concern uh, throughout uh, the Russian Empire uh, throughout the period of the Soviet Union uh, that we'll discuss in a bit more detail, and it continues uh, to this uh, day. Uh, in that regard, uh, the expansion of Russian territory has also been uh, co controversial in various ways. Uh, seen often uh, as a kind of a gathering uh, of Slavic populations uh, under uh, Russian leadership. In this regard, uh, the uh, Russian foreign policy uh, has uh, consistently be, been influenced uh, by the sense of solidarity with other uh, Slavic uh, regions. Uh, something that uh, is uh, currently uh, visible, uh, or more recently visible, uh, in the relationship between uh, the Russian Federation uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the state of Serbia, uh, the, uh, as it emerged uh, from uh, uh, the uh, remnants of the Yugoslav uh, state. Uh, it is uh, that close connection uh, between Serbia, uh, which is Slavic, uh, as opposed to its, uh, the other populations of uh, Yugoslavia, uh, that uh, convinced uh, Russia uh, to back the Serbian state uh, to prevent any international intervention uh, in uh, the uh, war uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, the 1990s uh, in the Yugoslavian territory uh, through the United Nations, uh, which uh, uh, Russia consistently uh, vetoed. Uh, and that ultimately uh, meant uh, that uh, when a military intervention in that conflict took place, it took place under the auspices of NATO, uh, not under the auspices of, of the United Nations. Now, uh, the final um, aspect uh, of uh, Russian history that has been fairly consistent uh, throughout its history uh, is the reliance on short-term uh, alliances uh, to deal with specific uh, threats, uh, as opposed to uh, a tendency toward more long-term uh, treaty commitments. Uh, the sole ex exception to that uh, is uh, the uh, period of the Cold War, uh, when the United States, when pardon me, the Soviet Union uh, did engage uh, in the Warsaw Water Treaty uh, Organization. Uh, prior to that, uh, it's uh, the more uh, general pattern uh, was uh, well illustrated uh, by uh, the behavior of Russia during the Second World War. Uh, when it formed uh, rather short-term alliances, uh, which were always understood as relatively short-term alliances, uh, facilitated by uh, the joint en enmity toward uh, the fascist regimes in uh, Western Europe, uh, that brought the, United, uh, the Soviet Union into an alliance with the United States and Great Britain. Uh, this was certainly not uh, because uh, Stalin or the Russian uh, leadership uh, had any illusions about the long-term interests uh, or compatibility of interests between the Soviet Union and uh, Great Britain and the United States, uh, but uh, simply because of its temporary usefulness uh, in uh, the confrontation uh, with Nazi Germany in particular. Uh, now, as I pointed out, um, Russia, unlike uh, the other cases uh, that we've looked at so far, in particular the United States, uh, has gone through a succession of different regime types uh, that have had a very different domestic uh, nature 
uh, thought that shared co considerable consistencies, as Robert Legbold uh, argued in the uh, chapter assigned in your readings, uh, in regard to their foreign policies. Uh, in that regard, I'll just give you a very brief uh, list, uh, as he puts them, uh, that he describes the period from 1700 till 1825 as the Patrine Empire. Uh, in 1825, uh, the Tsarist regime undertook an uh, attempt uh, to modernize uh, Russia, uh, which lasted until 1917, uh, but was largely incomplete. Uh, it did see during that period uh, the uh, liberation of the serfs or the elimination of serfdom uh, in uh, Russia. Uh, but Russia, by 1917, remained a largely feudal society and a largely agrarian society. Uh, the um, revolution in 1917 ushered in what he describes as an international state of nations. Uh, we'll talk about what he means, means by that uh, in a few minutes, uh, which was replaced by uh, 1932 uh, by what he describes as a nationalizing empire. Uh, which lasted until 1985. Uh, in that regard, he's referring to uh, the uh, rule of uh, Joseph Stalin and his successors, uh, and uh, the running of what became known as a command economy uh, under, uh, uh, under his rule. Uh, in 1985, uh, with the arrival of power uh, by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, the nature of the regime uh, changed uh, toward, a, uh, toward what Lake Wall describes as a transitory empire. Uh, which, of course, uh, led to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, and we'll talk about the reasons for that and the foreign policy of implications in a few minutes. Uh, that gave rise to a weakened multinational state, uh, from 1991, uh, he puts it until 1908, uh, or, pardon, until 2008, Although I would say that in that regard, uh, he uh, is kind of uh, papering over a rather drastic transition uh, in the nature of the uh, government uh, in Russia, uh, in the transition from Boris Yeltsin's uh, uh, government uh, to his successor, uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Vladimir Putin's government in that regard is not simply a continuation uh, of uh, the uh, government of uh, Boris Yeltsin. Uh, but rather a fairly sharp departure from uh, Boris Yeltsin's policies uh, in an attempt to uh, try to restore uh, the Russian state, state uh, to uh, its former glory. Uh, it is debatable uh, whether uh, Vladimir Putin has any ambitions uh, to expand uh, the uh, Russian uh, Federation uh, back to its pre-Soviet uh, uh, orders to its Soviet borders. Uh, the Russian Federation currently is roughly back to where it was in 1650 in terms of its territory. Uh, quite clearly, uh, the rest of the world, uh, in particular the uh, Western powers, uh, see, uh, Vladimir Putin, or the, see in Vladimir Putin a leader uh, with greater ambition uh, for uh, uh, restoring Russian power uh, and restoring its influence uh, in its uh, general vicinity. Uh, but uh, see him uh, as uh, an aggressor in a, on a far larger scale, uh, in particular because of uh, the various movements that he has made uh, in terms of uh, uh, creating a greater Russian influence outside of its, in the immediate uh, vicinity uh, of uh, the Russian Federation, uh, such as by rebuilding uh, ties uh, with uh, countries uh, far away from uh, Russia, uh, including uh, its um, a closer relationship uh, with the state of Venezuela uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, to understand Russian foreign policy in the current context, uh, I don't want to take you through a long uh, discussion of, of Russian history and Russian development. Uh, suffice it to say, however, uh, that it is under important to understand uh, some of the basic changes that took place within Russia, especially in the 20th century, uh, and how those, those have had an impact uh, on uh, Russian political culture uh, today uh, and on the structure of Russian interests uh, as uh, they uh, continue uh, in the uh, present as well. Uh, toward that end, uh, it is certainly worth noting uh, that uh, when uh, the Russian Revolution took place in 1917, uh, that ushered in uh, the uh, communist uh, government of Vladimir Lenin, uh, Russia was still, uh, to a large extent, a feudal state. A feudal state 
uh, incapable uh, of uh, really building uh, the kind kind of uh, socialism and communism uh, that Karl Marx had envisioned in his writings. Uh, and in that regard, uh, the first stage uh, of uh, the Russian Revolution, uh, as um, Lenin had envisioned it, uh, to a considerable extent changed uh, the nature of Marxist thinking. Uh, first of all, uh, Vladimir Lenin argued uh, that uh, the revolution in, uh, in Russia uh, is uh, explainable uh, insofar uh, as uh, he understood uh, the capitalist system as above all else an international system and saw Russia as being at the in the beginnings of a drastic transformation uh, shaped by capitalist forces uh, that above all else weakened uh, the uh, regime uh, of uh, the Tsar. Uh, it's interesting to note in that regard uh, that uh, the attitude of the communist parties uh, under the leadership of Lenin uh, prior to World War I uh, saw World War I as essentially uh, a inter-imperialist uh, rivalry uh, in which uh, the working class of the uh, working classes of Western Europe and elsewhere had no stake and refused uh, therefore any support uh, for the national governments involved in these uh, various wars, uh, which of course made them uh, seem uh, from the perspective of, for example, the German government uh, uh, as uh, traitors. Uh, traitors that refused to come to the defense of the fatherland when it was under under uh, under attack and so on, and I suspect the same attitude prevailed in most other countries uh, that uh, expected uh, their citizens to be loyal first and foremost to their country, uh, not to their political party. Um, suffice it to say, however, uh, that uh, in the context of the communist uh, movement uh, prior to World War One. Uh, Vladimir Lenin saw, saw the uh, Communist Party uh, of uh, Russia as reacting uh, to what he called imperialism, uh, which he saw as this, uh, the highest and final stage of capitalism. And he therefore argued uh, that uh, if imperialism is indeed the highest and, uh, stage of capitalism, and in his eyes the final stage of capitalism, uh, that capitalism would be uh, battled uh, not so much uh, in the core countries where it was well, well consolidated and in the union movements there, although they had their role to play, uh, but rather on the periphery, where it was yet uh, to uh, establish itself uh, in uh, a way that, it could, uh, that uh, was stable. Uh, and uh, that as ex accidental as uh, the success of the Russian Revolution was uh, in that context, uh, being facilitated essentially by the disruption of World War I, uh, that it was the role uh, of the Communist Party in Russia uh, to hold on to power, to transform Russian society, and to use its base of power uh, to support revolutionary movements around the world. It's in that context that they formed the Communist Internationals uh, to facilitate the cooperation uh, of communist parties around the world uh, to bring about a world revolution. In that regard, it's not too surprising uh, that for all intents and purposes, uh, the success of the Bolsheviks uh, in the latter half of 1917 in consolidating control over uh, the, the Russian, uh, over the Soviet Union, uh, was perceived by uh, the countries of the capitalist West uh, as a declaration of war against them. Their stated purpose was to overthrow the governments of, uh, of uh, capitalist countries uh, through close cooperation with the communist parties in those countries. It's also, therefore, not too surprising uh, that the Soviet Union uh, found itself almost immediately under attack uh, from its neighbors, not directly in terms of an invasion, uh, but rather indirectly in the form of uh, military support uh, and uh, aid and so on uh, to uh, counter-revolutionary movements uh, within Russia, uh, the remnants of the uh, old uh, imperial uh, military and so on, uh, that uh, as uh, it became known as the White Russians uh, that were heavily supported uh, by the United States and Great Britain in particular uh, in their attempts to reverse the Russian Revolution. Uh, those, as you probably know, uh, failed uh, to uh, bring about or to dislodge uh, the Bolsheviks uh, from power uh, in, uh, in Moscow. 
Um, but nonetheless made evident uh, that uh, Russia uh, had to, or the Soviet Union, uh, had above all else to defend itself and to stabilize its own revolution uh, before it be could become a prominent and powerful player in promoting re revolution elsewhere. Uh, now it's interesting in that regard uh, to also note uh, that uh, this entailed, above all else, uh, for the Soviet Union to come overcome its e economic backwardness, uh, which it had inherited uh, from the Tsarist government. Um, and it's worth talking a little bit about uh, that uh, economic backwardness. Uh, why was Russia so economically backward? Uh, why had uh, the kinds of processes that prevailed in Western European countries uh, that gave rise to a middle class uh, and uh, to industries and so on in places like Germany, uh, Holland, uh, France, uh, Britain, and so on, not taken place in uh, Tsarist Russia? Uh, the main uh, read or the best way to explain that uh, is essentially uh, that uh, the czarist regimes uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Russia uh, always looked to Europe uh, and recognized uh, that modernization was a two-edged so sword. Uh, in other words, uh, while it increased the power uh, of uh, states like Britain and Great Germany, uh, and Germany, it also undermined uh, the powers of its traditional elites. In other words, uh, to modernize uh, Russia uh, could unleash forces within Russian society uh, that would undermine the position of those traditional elites in precisely the way that uh, modernization uh, in uh, France uh, had given rise uh, to uh, opposition to a monarchical rule and ultimately to the French Revolution. Uh, in that regard, uh, the uh, elites in Russia but we're always rather half-hearted about uh, pursuing any kind of drastic modernization or allowing uh, major industrializations and things along those lines to take place. Um, at the same time that they recognized uh, that uh, not to uh, part uh, pursue uh, those kinds of goals uh, left them in an economically backward position. Uh, the result of that is, that, of course, that by the time that the Russian Revolution took place, uh, Russia was still a very backward country, uh, overwhelmingly dependent on agriculture, uh, with a very small uh, industrial working class, certainly not one that could control the straight state by democratic means. Uh, and the vast majority uh, of uh, Russian citizens uh, were peasants, uh, peasants that were understood by the Communist Party uh, to be a, rea a reactionary force uh, that had to be transformed uh, as quickly as possible uh, into a modern working class, into a modern proletariat uh, that could be controlled by the Communist Party. Uh, now that had two implications, one of which is that whereas many uh, Marxists, uh, and in particular uh, those that were uh, of a slightly more anarchistic uh, um, inclination uh, than Karl Marx himself, uh, viewed uh, the arrival of socialism uh, as uh, being carried on a mass movement that represented the vast majority of uh, the societies in which that transition was to take place and was to displace uh, the narrow elites that dominated those societies uh, under a capitalist system. Uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, uh, obviously, uh, that could not be the case uh, since the uh, working, uh, the, uh, pardon me, the Communist Party, uh, which had its support uh, in the very small working class uh, within uh, uh, within uh, Russian society represented only a very tiny portion of the population. Uh, what uh, grew out of this uh, was uh, the understanding uh, uh, that is often called vanguardism. Uh, in other words, uh, that the communist intellectuals led by uh, uh, Vladimir Lenin uh, saw themselves as having the responsibility of guiding uh, the rest of their society to the goals uh, that uh, they understood, but they, that uh, the people uh, themselves were incapable of understanding. Uh, in other words, a kind of an authoritarian uh, transition uh, to uh, a less authoritarian system. Uh, Lenin uh, also recognized, however, uh, that capitalist forces uh, were enormously important uh, in bringing about the kinds of kind of social transition uh, that created the pre preconditions uh, for building a modern socialist and ultimately communist state. And that Russia uh, could not simply bypass uh, that phase 
uh, and consequently needed to unleash capitalist forces uh, to bring about an industrialization uh, within uh, Russia. Uh, toward that end, uh, he initially uh, proposed uh, what became known as the New Economic po pro uh, Program, NEP, uh, which was designed essentially to do exactly that. The basic idea was that the Communist Party would hang on to political power, but unleash forces, uh, economic forces within society uh, that uh, would achieve essentially uh, what a ca capitalist market system uh, achieved in places like uh, the United States and Germany. Uh, by allowing market forces uh, to um, largely uh, determine uh, the investments of, of uh, companies. Uh, this, however, uh, proved uh, for the communist leadership uh, too slow. Uh, and uh, Vladimir Lenin, uh, of course, died in 1923, uh, shortly after uh, the uh, Russian Revolution, uh, and was replaced uh, by uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, who uh, took a very different approach uh, and consolidated, consolidated his uh, rule, uh, according to Lechvold, roughly around 1932, uh, and initiated a very different kind of state-driven uh, industrialization uh, based on what uh, became known as command economies. In which bureaucrats within the Soviet state uh, drew up ambitious plans for uh, the industries that they wanted to develop uh, and uh, the rate at which they wanted to develop them, uh, formulated those development goals into what became known as five-year plans uh, with, the, uh, uh, with uh, quotas attached as to what had to be achieved uh, by the various sectors, uh, and uh, implemented those uh, not through uh, market mechanisms, uh, but rather through state planning. Uh, now, I don't want to give you a lesson in economics and why uh, this might have been a bad idea in many ways. Uh, uh, in essence, uh, it left no scope for the market uh, to determine uh, what things, that pe what kinds of uh, goods people actually wanted uh, by having price mechanisms that, uh, that increase the prices of those things that are in high demand uh, and decrease the prices of things that are uh, in, uh, in uh, um, uh, oversupplied, um, and in that regard, uh, regard resulted in uh, enormous levels of inefficiency uh, that are often blamed uh, for the ultimate uh, demise uh, of the Soviet Union uh, by the uh, end of the 1980s. Um, certainly, demand economies uh, in that regard uh, are problematic, uh, and uh, one uh, way of understanding uh, the Soviet Union uh, is to point out uh, that um, it, in many ways, uh, embodied uh, precisely the worries uh, that Max Weber voiced uh, about uh, Lenin uh, and Marxist thought more generally uh, in his writings, uh, in which he argued uh, that uh, the chief defining uh, uh, characteristic uh, of modern societies, uh, the most impressive aspect of modern societies, was not capitalism, uh, but rather was bureaucracy. Uh, that in modern societies were increasingly bureauc bureaucratically organized, uh, whether those were private bureaucracies in the form of major industrial corporations or public bureaucracies in the form of major ministries, all of them were bureaucratically organized. And that uh, Lenin's view of, uh, of, uh, of liberation uh, essentially was one uh, that would transform an already bureaucratized uh, capitalism uh, into one uh, in which uh, there were no, not competing bureaucracies, uh, but rather a single state bureaucracy uh, that controlled virtually everything. Uh, and he argued that this was uh, certainly not an image of liberation that he would endorse, uh, but rather a kind of an iron cage uh, from which there was a little in the way of escape. Um, all of that is certainly accurate, uh, and uh, life in the Soviet Union uh, was uh, probably not uh, particularly pleasant uh, for most of those uh, that uh, lived under uh, the Soviet system. Uh, but to truly understand the impact of the Soviet system, uh, we have to get a little bit beyond uh, the uh, conventional wisdoms about uh, the um, problems uh, with command economies uh, and uh, their, its, uh, its ultimate demise. To recognize that while the Soviet Union ultimately failed to meet the needs of its population, uh, which resulted in uh, its uh, demise in 1989 and thereafter, uh, 
uh, it was far more successful than virtually anyone would have expected it to be uh, in 1917. In that regard, I don't want to get you, uh, take you through a long list of statistics that demonstrate uh, this effectiveness, uh, but simply uh, to cite some very basic examples. Uh, one way of, uh, of uh, taking a shortcut in this regard is to note uh, that uh, the uh, Soviet leader uh, that replaced uh, Stalin uh, in uh, 1953 after uh, Stalin's death, uh, Khrushchev, Nikola Khrushchev, uh, visited uh, the United States uh, in um, uh, 1960, uh, not the United States so much as the United Nations, which happens to be in New York City. Uh, part of the UN treaty is that uh, everyone has the right to travel to, uh, to the United, uh, United States. Uh, the U.S. cannot deny them their visa if they are going to visit the United Nations. Uh, interestingly, the Trump administration has now backed away from that uh, by refusing to allow certain individuals from countries like Iran uh, to come and give speeches uh, in, the, uh, in the United Nations. Um, interesting to see how, how that plays out in the long term and whether there's major complaints from the international community about uh, the United States uh, trying to veto access to the United Nations. Uh, suffice it to say uh, that in 1960, uh, the United States was still abiding by that, and despite the fact that the Soviet Union was seen as a, a major threat uh, to uh, Western countries in general and, uh, uh, and uh, to the United States specifically, uh, he was nonetheless allowed to come to give a speech at the United Nations. And in that speech, he apparently um, uh, used the phrase, uh, we will bury you, uh, to describe uh, the progress uh, of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and as you can probably imagine, uh, at the height of the Cold War, uh, that sent people uh, uh, screaming in protest uh, and uh, with the suggestion that he was threatening the world with nuclear destruction. Uh, and he was asked about that by journalists, and he immediately said, no, that's not at all what I meant. Uh, I, have no, I have no intention of literally bur burying anyone. Uh, let alone the United States or, or its, uh, its allies. Uh, what I meant uh, was a reference uh, to uh, our understandings uh, of uh, Marxist principles, uh, which have always uh, pointed out, uh, th uh, according to Marxist studies, uh, that uh, the history of human societies is one of a progression of economic systems in which those that are more progressive invariably replace those that are uh, less progressive. In that regard, hunting and gathering societies gave way uh, to modern civilization in the form of slave-based societies, in large part because these slave-based societies were better able at concentrating resources in such a way as to project power and to pr produce, pr produce uh, human progress. Feudal societies uh, replaced uh, slave-based societies because they were better able at organizing uh, the productive capacities of humans uh, than uh, their slave-based counterparts, and therefore large, largely replaced them. Capitalism ultimately replaced feudalism for the same reason, uh, because as Marx put it, it was the great locomotive of history that better than any other system uh, mobilized the forces of humanity and the resources available on the planet uh, to produce technological progress and so on and so forth. In the same sense, socialism is more progressive than capitalism and will eventually replace capitalism because of its enormous success. And in that regard, he pointed out that in 1960, uh, the uh, Soviet Union was producing three times as many engineers in its universities uh, than, their, uh, than the United States. Uh, that in the short period from 1917 to, 19, uh, to uh, when the uh, Nazis attacked uh, 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 the Soviet Union in the early 1940s, uh, the Soviet Union had gone from a backward, feudal, agrarian state to being able to not only hold at bay, but ultimately defeat the most productive and most powerful country in the capitalist world, which at the time was certainly Germany. Uh, furthermore, uh, he pointed out uh, that since uh, that enormously destructive war, uh, enormously destructive both in Germany and in particular in Russia, uh, which lost more citizens during the Second World War uh, than any country uh, involved in the conflict, uh, estimated around 25 million, uh, that in the aftermath of all that destruction, uh, Russia successfully developed a nuclear weapon. Uh, very shortly thereafter, uh, successfully developed an uh, H-bomb along with the United States. Uh, that it beat the United States in the space race by being the first to put a satellite into orbit. And shortly thereafter, the first to put uh, a uh, manned spacecraft into orbit. Uh, 
both embarrassing events that ultimately led to uh, John F. Kennedy announcing uh, that he wanted to put a man on the moon uh, by the end of the decade, uh, which was largely a response to the enormous success uh, the Soviets had uh, in exploring space and the substantial lead that they had in uh, that regard. Um, in that respect, uh, he uh, argued uh, that all signs uh, point to that the Soviet Union is progressing much faster uh, than its capitalist counterparts and will ultimately replace them. Uh, we know, of course, uh, that that was a rather rosy assessment uh, and that despite the fairly tremendous successes that the Soviet Union did indeed have uh, in uh, regard uh, to uh, those achievements, uh, that it ultimately failed uh, to keep up uh, with the ambitions of its own citizens uh, and uh, with uh, the standards of living uh, in Western countries uh, that brought it to an end. Uh, but I think it is important uh, in that regard to recognize uh, at least those limited levels of success uh, in the Soviet system. And to recognize in that context also uh, that uh, the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union uh, was not something that was universally celebrated either within uh, the uh, Soviet Union itself or for that matter among its allies. Uh, so in East Germany, for example, uh, the first uh, region to break away from Soviet control after, uh, at the end of the Cold War, um, there have been numerous studies uh, done on uh, the attitudes of uh, former East German citizens uh, uh, to uh, the uh, uh, transition uh, to becoming part of uh, a unified Germany uh, and to their communist past. Uh, and one of the phrases that is uh, repeated over and over again uh, by uh, people uh, from East Germany is that, uh, well, we recognized uh, after the collapse of, the, of East Germany that uh, everything that our communist government told us about communism was all a pack of lies. But it turns out that everything they told us about com capitalism turns out to be perfectly true. Uh, in other words, uh, that quite a few of them uh, have found uh, uh, some buyer's regret uh, in uh, rejoining uh, Germany, even though in doing so uh, they joined uh, one of the most prosperous countries uh, in the world. Uh, one reason for that uh, is easy to understand. Uh, despite uh, the low standard of living uh, in East Germany, uh, when compared to its Western counterparts under that command economy, uh, East Germans uh, had certain privileges uh, that uh, they very quickly lost, one of which was guaranteed employment. Uh, under a command economy, there's no such thing as unemployment. And that means there's no such thing as getting fired uh, because everyone is guaranteed employment. Uh, they might not get paid a huge amount for it. Uh, they might not have great uh, scope for upward mobility and so on and so forth. And indeed, uh, many of the studies of East Germany found that East Germans started to change uh, in terms of their attitudes rather drastically. Since there was not much point in working hard to achieve upward mobility, they didn't work very hard. Uh, and took as, off as many hours as possible. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, focused more on uh, their relationship with family and various other creative exercises and so on uh, than on being able to expand consumer uh, behavior and so on and so forth. Um, well, their first experience with capitalism um, what happened in East Germany uh, after it unified with, uh, with West Germany? Uh, that's putting it rather mildly. Uh, basically, uh, all of those enterprises that employed people in East Germany uh, were incapable of, of competing with their West German counterparts uh, and were suddenly thrown overnight into having to compete directly with some of the most efficient capitalist enterprises on the planet. Rather predictably, all of them more or less went bankrupt within a couple of months and threw pretty much all of the, uh, the workers in uh, West Germany or in East Germany into unemployment. And that resulted in a massive flow of East Germans into West Germany in, this, in, in search for, uh, for employment. Uh, which in turn created a housing crisis in West Germany and resulted in the West German government investing enormous sums into the reconstruction of East Germany uh, in order to create some employment in East Germany in order to prevent that wave from destabilizing, destabilizing the West German economy, uh, which came close to bankrupting West Germany. And is one reason uh, why the European Union refused to expand eastward uh, after uh, the collapse of the other uh, uh, Soviet uh, um, uh, satellite states in Eastern Europe, in essence because they expected that uh, uh, in the, a rapid entry of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and so on and so forth into the European Union uh, would result in East Germany writ large and bankrupt the entire system. Uh, it's for that reason to a considerable extent uh, why NATO ended up expanding eastward rather than the European Union, uh, despite promises given at the time that that would not occur. Um, how did I get onto that? Right. Uh, 
the collapse of the Soviet Union in that regard uh, was uh, somewhat similar uh, to uh, the collapse uh, in East Germany. Uh, certainly, it resulted uh, to a considerable extent uh, from the fact uh, that the Soviet Union uh, in the 1970s and 80s uh, devoted enormous amounts of resources uh, to its security needs, uh, in particular uh, with the growing conflict uh, on its periphery uh, in Afghanistan, uh, which resulted in a uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Uh, and the renewal of the Cold War under the Reagan administration, uh, which, as you might recall, uh, announced in uh, 1980 uh, that it would pursue uh, a uh, what uh, became known as the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, or otherwise known as Star Wars, uh, a uh, project uh, to create a missile shield uh, that would uh, be able to guard uh, the United States territory against any kind of incoming missile uh, attack from the Soviet Union. Uh, it was, of course, declared uh, illegal uh, by, um, or was contrary to the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty uh, that was signed by the United States and the Soviet Union uh, in the late 1960s. Uh, but Reagan explained uh, that uh, they were only, the program was only to do research into uh, the technologies, but not to deploy it, and that the uh, treaty only referred to deploying such a system, not uh, doing research to develop such a system. And uh, furthermore, if he was successful in developing such a system, he would happily share that technology with the Soviets and allow them to build their own missile shield uh, to end nuclear war forever. Uh, no one quite believed that. Uh, but uh, the obvious implication for Russia, uh, was, or for the Soviet Union, was that if the Americans were starting to build a missile shield, uh, even if it wasn't going to be a very effective missile shield, uh, the only response on the part of uh, the uh, Russians was to try to do research on their own to develop their own missile shields. Uh, which was enormously expensive, uh, and uh, to counter that attempt by the United States in case the Americans were successful in developing such a missile shield by the only strategy that would work in that regard. And what's the best way to uh, make sure that your missiles can penetrate a missile shield uh, if, uh, if such a missile shield is developed? Well, the best way to do so is to have as many missiles as possible. Uh, they might be able to knock down some of them, but not all of them. Uh, in other words, uh, the 1980s saw a massive ramping up of military spending uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, uh, which certainly prevented uh, a uh, focus uh, in the uh, Soviet economy uh, on expanding uh, consumer goods and things along those lines. Um, I had friends that visited the Soviet Union in the 1980s, uh, uh, one as a graduate student uh, to do uh, graduate research, uh, and it was interesting uh, to uh, find, to uh, in the United States at the time, uh, anyone that visited Russia first had to be debriefed by the, uh, by, uh, the intelligence agencies uh, to uh, make sure that they didn't get themselves in trouble over there. And they were always debriefed afterwards, uh, after their return, in terms of what their experience was. Did they find out anything of that sort? Um, uh, well, uh, in their debrief, in the, in the uh, briefing uh, uh, going to uh, Russia, uh, he asked, well, what kind of things should I bring? Uh, and uh, they, he was told that the best thing to bring uh, is lots of blue jeans. Uh, because you could play trade, trade Levi's for uh, fortune uh, in Russia. Now, it's not that the Russians needed technology that they didn't have to make something like Levi's or to reverse engineer uh, American jeans. Uh, it's simply that their resources were elsewhere. Uh, and so uh, those kinds of things remained off the shelf. The other thing, uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, there was uh, the general um, uh, adage uh, that, uh, well, the Soviets uh, thought of the idea of fashion uh, and uh, uh, as it's practiced in the West, uh, is part of Western decadence. Uh, the, is a kind of a bourgeois concept that you have to be in style all the time, that your clothes from last year are no longer any good because they don't they have the right cut that's in this year and so on and so forth, all of which is, um, no, I largely agree with, but nonetheless, that's another matter. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, the uh, idea uh, in Russia was to create rational consumers uh, that wouldn't be driven by irrational concerns about uh, whether uh, their pants should be flared or straight-legged or, or whatever the uh, current fashion is. Uh, but uh, they obviously completely failed in being able to achieve that. Uh, the adage was always that uh, citizens in the Soviet Union know very, very well what's in fashion. Whatever's on the shelves of the stores in the Soviet Union is not in fashion. And whatever isn't uh, is uh, highly desirable. And what wasn't in fashion, what wasn't on the shelves, was Levi's and various other Western goods. Um, in other words, in the Soviet Union, the discontent with the Communist Party uh, was not altogether different from the discontent uh, that uh, brought down the government, uh, the satellite government in East Germany. 
uh, when uh, those that escaped the East German government uh, in uh, the early stages of, the, of its collapse were interviewed in West Germany about why they were escaping uh, to the West, why they rejected the East German state, the answer was fairly consistent. Uh, I want to drive a decent car for once. Uh, or uh, I want to have a, a nicer house, or I want to have decent clothes, and so on and so forth. It focused very much on standard of living kinds of, of, of uh, issues. And in East Germany, that's somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat uh, um, understandable, because East Germans uh, had access to West German television, and consequently were well aware of what was uh, in, uh, in West Germany, what the latest uh, automobile uh, uh, models looked like, and how they compared to the only cars that were available in East Germany, which were called Trebis, uh, which were slightly smaller than VW Bug and uh, technologically even less sophisticated than old VW Bug uh, and uh, enormously polluting vehicles. Uh, in other words, it was material interest that to a large extent pulled, uh, the, uh, or pulled down uh, the communist regimes uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, and just as uh, the, communist, uh, the, bring, uh, the collapse of the communist government in East Germany uh, resulted in economic uh, chaos, uh, so too. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, resulted uh, in an immediate decline in the standard of living uh, of uh, Soviet citizens. Uh, as uh, Stephen Cohen uh, described it, it is the most steep decline in the standard of living of any country in the world uh, outside of warfare. Uh, at, uh, in 1989, uh, the uh, um, life expectancy uh, in uh, the Soviet Union uh, was around 76 to 77 years, uh, which was roughly in keeping with life expectancy in uh, other parts of the developed world. Uh, by uh, the end of the 1990s, uh, it was somewhere around 60. Uh, in other words, it had drastically declined. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is uh, a rapid increase in poverty, a uh, rapid increase in malnutrition, uh, the disintegration of a healthcare system that was reasonably well functioning uh, prior to the collapse, uh, and uh, the um, drastic redistribution of resources in the Soviet in the post-Soviet uh, sphere upward. Uh, now, uh, before uh, we look at uh, that transition and its impact on uh, the foreign policy of the Soviet uh, of, uh, the, of Russia, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the uh, foreign policies uh, under the Soviet Union. As I pointed out, uh, the goal of the Soviet Union uh, when uh, it was established in 1917 uh, was to be the vanguard of a world revolution. And it saw its role as supporting revolutionary movements around the world. Uh, but it also became fairly quickly evident uh, that if that was the goal, uh, and if the Soviet Union acted on that goal, uh, it would immediately incur considerable uh, opposition from other regions of the world, uh, if not an overthrow and a military invasion uh, from other regions of the world. Uh, Consequently, uh, the Soviet Union uh, largely backed away from that goal and instead committed itself to building socialism in one country. In other words, focusing on consolidating uh, communist rule in the Soviet Union itself rather than trying to export the revolution. Uh, the implication of that is uh, that uh, while, this, while the Soviet Union had enormous influence in other parts of the world through the communist parties, uh, that existed in virtually every other major capitalist country uh, in the world, uh, it increasingly used that influence, uh, not in order to advance revolutionary causes in other countries, uh, but rather to advance uh, its own uh, foreign policy uh, and security interests domestically. Uh, one of the best examples uh, of that change uh, in attitude uh, was the role that the Soviet Union played and the Communist Party uh, played uh, in the Spanish Civil War uh, in the 19, uh, 1930s. Uh, in that uh, instance, uh, the uh, civil war that broke out between the Republican forces uh, backing a elected go liberal government uh, and uh, the uh, right-wing forces of uh, General Franco uh, attempting to uh, in, uh, institute a uh, fascist dictatorship uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Spain. Uh, gave rise to spontaneous uprisings uh, of uh, peasants uh, and uh, workers not controlled uh, by uh, any particular political movement uh, that uh, is, uh, are largely described as anarcho-syndicalists. Uh, that in essence uh, took over the agrarian sector by collectivizing uh, the agrarian sector uh, in uh, most of the regions of Spain, 
uh, and took over uh, most of the uh, factories in places like Barcelona, Madrid, and so on and so forth. Um, in other words, it was a very powerful revolutionary movement uh, bringing about a, a complete tran uh, uh, transformation uh, of Spain, uh, largely uh, along the lines uh, of what many uh, in the communist movements in the 19th century envisioned. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Communist Party of Spain did not support those movements uh, and instead supported the liberal, liberal government. Uh, it saw it, uh, the fundamental uh, problem uh, as being created to create a popular unity movement against uh, Franco uh, and uh, saw the uh, anarcho, uh, anarcho syndicalist movements uh, that had uh, transformed uh, uh, Spanish society as a threat to maintaining that um, popular front uh, by alienating uh, the middle classes uh, within, uh, within Spain, and in particular uh, by middle classes, Marxists usually refer uh, to uh, the industrialists. Uh, instead, they backed uh, the liberal government, uh, which, of course, uh, was unsuccessful at, uh, at um, uh, defeating uh, the forces of Franco uh, and thus ushered in uh, a fascist regime in Spain. Insofar as uh, Russia uh, backed uh, revolutionary movements in other parts of the world, uh, that picture uh, emerged uh, to a somewhat more convincing uh, extent uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, but in that context, once again, uh, the Soviet Union uh, was uh, probably somewhat reluctant uh, rather than uh, an active promoter uh, of revolutionary movements. Uh, it's easy to uh, make the mistake to think uh, that uh, the Soviet Union played a strong role uh, in bringing about the revolution uh, in uh, Cuba uh, that brought down the Batista government uh, in uh, 1959. Uh, but in fact, there were no connections uh, between Che Guevara and uh, Fidel Castro and the Soviet Union uh, prior to the taking of power uh, in, uh, by those forces in Havana. Um, the Soviet Union was rather reluctant to support uh, revolutionary movements uh, or revolutionary action among uh, communist uh, parties uh, in uh, Latin America in general and in Cuba in particular. One reason for that is because the revolutions in Cuba, and by the way, that's to a large extent the, the case in China as well, uh, and perhaps I should have mentioned the Chinese case first. Uh, the Chinese and the Cuban revolutions uh, were uh, built on the basis of support from, from peasants. Uh, that's what the, the major distinction between Maoism and, uh, and, uh, the, and Leninism uh, was that uh, Lenin uh, saw uh, the peasantry as largely uh, reactionary uh, and uneducated and uh, uh, not uh, having revolutionary potential, uh, whereas Mao Zedong organized uh, his forces exclusively among the peasantry uh, and uh, was successful in overthrowing the uh, nationalist government in China on the basis of that peasant support. Uh, the same was true uh, for uh, the um, uh, Cuban uh, revolutionary movement. Uh, it organized among uh, farm workers, uh, not among uh, the industrial working class, among peasants, so to speak. Uh, and this was, uh, to a large extent, through, through throughout uh, Latin America, uh, where the industrial working class uh, in which uh, the communists uh, organized uh, was a very tiny minority, uh, and uh, generally uh, was not uh, particularly revolutionary uh, in its support in overthrowing uh, 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 leftist governments. Um, the Soviet Union uh, rather reluctantly uh, supported uh, the uh, Cuban revolutionary movement after the Bay of Pigs operate, uh, uh, invasion uh, by the United States. Uh, it uh, also uh, supported, uh, but again, uh, somewhat passively, uh, resistance movements uh, and anti-colonial movements uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, perhaps the best uh, example in that regard uh, remains uh, in uh, the context of Africa, uh, where most of the anti-colonial movements uh, had close ties to uh, the communist parties. Uh, and uh, again, uh, one of the uh, uh, centers of activity in that regard uh, was the close collaboration between the Communist Party uh, of South Africa and the African National Congress. Uh, their membership overlapped to a considerable extent uh, so much so that uh, Western powers generally considered the ANC to be a communist movement uh, and resisted uh, any um, 
uh, chance of, of allowing them to come to power, uh, in part for that reason. Um, it was in the frontline states uh, and uh, uh, those states uh, adjacent uh, to South Africa uh, and, uh, and uh, South Africa itself uh, that the Soviet Union did play a fairly substantial role uh, in supplying uh, the revolutionaries uh, with the means of overthrowing their governments. Uh, that was not so much uh, a successful venture uh, in regards uh, to South Africa. Uh, the South African uh, regime uh, collapsed uh, on its own in the later, later 90s, or the mid-1990s, uh, in part uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, its Western backers uh, were no longer willing to back it once the Soviet threat had uh, been largely eliminated. Uh, that was the main justification for backing a white minority uh, government uh, in Africa. Uh, but it was telling uh, in places uh, like the frontline states, in particular in Angola uh, and uh, Mozambique. Uh, the main contribution uh, to the revolutionary struggles uh, in that context uh, was in the provisions of armaments. And uh, the main uh, and most important uh, provision in that regard uh, is uh, that the Soviet Union developed uh, weapons uh, that became uh, the hallmark of, uh, of uh, anti-colonial movements. Anyone know what the most important one of those was? Pardon me? The AK-47. AK uh, that was developed in 1947 by Kalashnikov. Uh, and uh, the Russians, uh, rather deliberately, uh, never patented uh, the design of the AK-47. In fact, quite the contrary. Uh, they widely published the design of the AK-47 uh, in order to, fit, to encourage as many people as possible to produce a the weapon that was very simple to produce, uh, very reliable uh, in uh, battle, and that thus became the hallmark uh, of uh, anti-resistance movement or anti-colonial movements, uh, in particular in Africa. Uh, the best symbol of that uh, is uh, the flag of Mozambique, uh, which still prominently features uh, the AK-47 uh, as a, uh, part of its flag. Uh, in uh, acknowledgement of the enormous, uh, the important role that that weapon played in being able to overthrow Portuguese rule, uh, both in uh, Mozambique and uh, in Angola. Uh, the Soviet Union in that context uh, certainly did uh, participate uh, in uh, trying to undermine uh, the, uh, uh, the dominance of Western powers uh, in regions like Africa as part of the Cold War. Uh, but it is still uh, rather uh, evident uh, that even in the aftermath of the Second World War, uh, the Soviet Union was above all else uh, keen to avoid a superpower confrontation uh, and uh, was reluctant uh, to support movements that might bring a superpower confrontation uh, uh, about. Uh, in that regard, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, Second World War, uh, it did not uh, strongly object uh, to the crushing of the anti-fascist movements in, uh, in uh, Greece or uh, Turkey uh, by uh, Western forces uh, to reassert their dominance in those areas, in part because uh, they, uh, the leadership of the Soviet Union uh, felt uh, that uh, to do so uh, would uh, draw out the conflict and would uh, lead uh, to an intervention within the Soviet Union or a direct confrontation uh, with the United States in that context. Um, Let's turn our attention uh, in this regard, uh, in, uh, at this point, uh, to uh, the uh, situation uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the transition uh, to a new uh, set of foreign policies uh, since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, to do so, we have to understand the nature of the collapse of the Soviet Union to a certain extent and its various implications. First of all, uh, as we noted before, uh, the collapse of the Soviet system uh, began uh, with the dissolution uh, of, the War, uh, of the Warsaw Pact, uh, which began uh, arguably in Germany, uh, but one could point uh, to other developments uh, that brought down the Soviet Union, uh, certainly the bankrupting of the, uh, of, uh, the Soviet military uh, in uh, their intervention in Afghanistan played a powerful role. Uh, the renewed arms race uh, that uh, uh, the Soviets had to uh, invest heavily in uh, played an important role. Uh, but the key uh, was uh, the collapse uh, of uh, the East German state. Uh, in which uh, the uh, leader, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, 
uh, intervened uh, to um, make an offer to Western countries uh, that he would not stand in the way of a unification of Germany uh, so long as uh, Germany became a neutral country between uh, the not the NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Uh, this was quickly rejected uh, by uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and Helmut Kohl, the leaders of West Germany and uh, the U.S., whereupon Gorbachev backed off and said that he would allow uh, for a reunification of Germany uh, within NATO so long as uh, the Western powers guaranteed that NATO would not move one inch further eastward, uh, to which they readily agreed, uh, in large part because uh, the uh, dissolute or the collapse of Eastern Germany uh, represented the collapse of the Warsaw Pact more generally. Uh, and the understanding uh, of the United States was that uh, the countries of Eastern Europe and Russia uh, thereafter were no longer a threat to the West. Uh, that, uh, as uh, Francis Fukuyama put it, the collapse of the Soviet Union represented the end of history, and essentially the only thing that was left to do was to incorporate all those territories into the capitalist world, including Russia. Uh, many pointed out that, therefore, NATO was largely irrelevant, and why bother keeping NATO at all? Uh, NATO, of course, uh, has an enormous bureaucracy that certainly has every interest in surviving, uh, and its various employees uh, certainly did not have an interest in losing their job. Uh, and uh, many of the supporters of NATO argued that NATO was capable of, uh, had managed to keep order within Western Europe uh, for the previous 50 years, and that uh, to maintain order within Europe uh, it remained necessary. Uh, NATO, therefore, remained in, uh, intact. Uh, As most of you know, uh, as uh, the uh, countries broke away from the uh, Warsaw Pact, increasingly uh, they had ambitions to become part of NATO and to part become more part of the European Union. Um, I won't talk too much about Eastern Europe. Uh, suffice it to say uh, that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union followed fairly short, shortly thereafter. And the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, was in many ways much more uh, complicated and much more of a threat uh, to international stability uh, than the breaking away of uh, the Warsaw Pact countries uh, from the Soviet Union. In essence, uh, the falling part of the Soviet Union created out of a single uh, multi-ethnic state, several different states, uh, the breakaway, breakaway republics in, uh, the, in Central Asia, uh, as well as wait, the breakaway republics of Ukraine uh, and uh, Georgia. And one of the most important worries in that regard uh, is that uh, the rest of the world uh, that previously faced one giant nuclear armed power uh, would suddenly face several nuclear armed powers, some of which with rather unstable and uncertain governments. And that certainly posed a major threat uh, to uh, the uh, international system. And it is to a considerable extent to the credit of uh, both the uh, government of uh, George Herbert Walker Bush uh, and uh, the Clinton administration uh, that they deftly uh, maneuvered uh, through diplomacy uh, to eliminate that outcome and, and to essentially create an um, agreement whereby all of the breakaway republics uh, from the Soviet Union surrendered their nuclear weapons uh, to the Ru Russian Federation uh, so that the Russian Federation graduated from this process as the only nuclear power uh, in uh, that context. Uh, by the way, um, it should be pointed out uh, that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, was asked uh, repeatedly uh, about uh, why the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, and he rejected most of the common uh, explanations. One of the more common explanation, uh, explanations was that when he seized power in uh, 1984, not seized power, came to power in 1984, uh, he recognized uh, the problems of the Soviet Union, in particular with regard to its economy, uh, and uh, the uh, lack of legitimacy uh, that its government had in the eyes of many of its citizens, and sought to deal with that uh, by instituting two programs, uh, Perestroika uh, and uh, Glasnost. Uh, Perestroika stands for, uh, for uh, restructuring, uh, refers to uh, opening up the economy uh, to greater levels of competition between uh, different uh, enterprises and creating essentially a kind of a market uh, within uh, the Soviet Union. And Glasnost uh, referred to uh, openness, or as a, uh, the word means openness, uh, which referred to opening up the political system uh, to greater competition. Uh, in other words, eliminating the monopoly of the Communist Party uh, on uh, competition within the political system uh, in um, uh, the Soviet Union. 
Uh, many have argued uh, that uh, the Soviet Union collapsed in large part because these programs opened up uh, a can of worms uh, that uh, the uh, Soviet state was simply not able to contain. Uh, that brought down eventually the government force of, of, uh, of um, uh, Gorbachev and led to uh, the seizing of power uh, by uh, non-communist forces under the leadership of Yeltsin. Uh, he for the most part rejects that as an explanation. He also rejects uh, that it was the Afghani uh, venture uh, that bankrupted uh, the Soviet Union, although he does acknowledge that it contributed to it. Uh, the um, force uh, that he argues was most decisive in bringing an end to the Soviet Union. Uh, anyone know? Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Uh, the nuclear accident in Chernobyl, uh, which uh, was at the time uh, the worst nuclear accident uh, in human history. Uh, many claim that it is still the worst ac nuclear accident in uh, human history. Uh, it is not. Uh, Fukushima has bypassed it by a long shot. Uh, and uh, while uh, 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 Chernobyl uh, was reasonably well contained within about a year or so of the uh, accident, uh, Fukushima is anything but contained at this point. Uh, it was a meltdown in three reactors, not just one. Uh, and uh, the cores of those three reactors have yet to be found. Uh, and basically, they melted right through the containment vessels uh, into the subsoil. Uh, and uh, uh, the only way that they can keep the, uh, the nuclear waste at station on top of that pool is by con continuously pouring water onto it. Uh, which, they, which then becomes radioactive and drains out of it and has to be stored in enormous uh, containers. Uh, 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 and uh, they simply run out of containers and therefore are simply allowing it to flow into the Pacific. Uh, so it's still a very worrisome situation. But let's not talk about that. Chernobyl, uh, he argues, bankrupted the Soviet Union for a very simple reason. Like Fukushima, uh, when it blew up, uh, radiation levels in, around, the, uh, around the nuclear reactor, the reactor were so high uh, that uh, it was impossible even to send robots into the uh, area to gauge uh, where, uh, what the damage was. Uh, and the only way to deal with it was to clean, uh, clean it up as quickly as possible. But the radiation levels were so high uh, that a person walking anywhere near that, uh, that area would receive their maximum uh, radiation exposure within about 10 minutes. And that meant, essentially, uh, that it was almost impossible to find volunteers to go in and, uh, and deal with that, uh, and that the only people that could be uh, asked to deal with that were people that could be commanded to deal with that. In other words, uh, members of the military. Uh, and those members of the military were given shovels and ordered into the, uh, the radiation zone, could spend their 10 minutes there before they were uh, got radiation sickness and then pulled out. Uh, and that meant that to uh, do that basic containment uh, of the facility, uh, required, well, uh, close to a, a million soldiers, somewhere over 700,000 soldiers, uh, that were subsequently uh, ill and incapable of, of performing their functions in other contexts. And that meant, uh, this occurred in 1987, and that meant that by the time that there were uprisings in Poland, uh, in uh, East Germany, uh, in Hungary, and so on, uh, that uh, uh, sought to distance themselves uh, from the Soviet regime, uh, the option that the Soviets had taken in 1958 uh, when uh, Czechoslovakia uh, had an uprising, and in Hungary uh, 10 years later, uh, of sending in the uh, Red Army uh, to put those rebellions down, simply was no longer an option. Uh, and that meant essentially uh, that the whole system uh, fell apart. Um, the aftermath uh, of that falling apart uh, saw the dissolution, uh, but also saw uh, a transfer, an economic transformation uh, of Russia. Stephen Cohen described that transformation, saying, um, Stephen Cohen, the, uh, most, uh, the foremost expert on Russian uh, history and uh, Russian politics, uh, teaches at NYU, uh, he described it as a failed crusade to remake, remake Russia in the image of the US, uh, and argues that the US essentially treated uh, the Russian government as a defeated enemy. Indeed. Uh, Officials in the Clinton administration, in particular uh, the most important uh, economic advisor, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, described the policies promoted uh, by the United States uh, for the restructuring of the uh, Russian economy uh, with the term, it's the spinach treatment. Uh, the spinach treatment. Uh, in other words, uh, it's the treatment, or it's sort of like uh, forcing the kid to eat the spinach that he doesn't really like. Uh, you as your parents know it's, it's good for him, and therefore you're going to force him to, uh, to eat it. Uh, in that regard, uh, the um, um, Jeffrey Sachs uh, applied uh, what uh, he referred to as shock treatment uh, to uh, the uh, Soviet economy, uh, 
In other words, what he advocated was a rapid transition to private ownership and to market economies, not a gradual transition of, uh, to uh, those kinds of institutions. Uh, and um, that rapid transition uh, took the form, first and foremost, of the privatization of state-owned property, of straight state-owned enterprises. Everything under the Soviet Union belonged to the state. The state owned everything, and everyone was technically an employee of the state. Now, the first problem with that uh, is if you throw everything uh, in the so former Soviet Union on the auction block and say, okay, we're going to sell all this off, what's the problem with that? Who can buy it? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, the uh, most likely uh, thing was that uh, foreign buyers would be able to outbid their Russian counterparts by a long shot and gobble up virtually everything that was worth anything uh, in Russia. And quite clearly, uh, even the United States wasn't particularly keen on, on that solution and it would have been unsustainable. Uh, consequently, uh, basically, uh, the privatization took place within the boundaries of, uh, or, or, of uh, Russia, uh, involving only uh, Russian citizens. But what Russian citizens had money to buy uh, large amounts of enter uh, enterprises? Yeah? Well, the oligarchs weren't oligarchs until after that process. But in essence, what it amounted to was those that were closely connected to the state. Uh, that had the ability to, uh, through their connections, uh, to finagle their way into the ownership of these private uh, uh, private assets, some of which were ab absolutely useless. Uh, those uh, There was uh, some attempts to privatize, for example, manufacturing industries simply by giving ownership to the workers uh, themselves, by, let, uh, by uh, giving shares uh, in those companies to uh, workers themselves. The problem with most of the manufacturing sector is that it wasn't competitive on world markets and consequently very quickly went bankrupt. Uh, within that environment. The areas that were enormously lucrative and that created that uh, very wealthy uh, uh, wealthy aristocracy or oligarchy as it's now called uh, were these extractive industries, in particular oil, gas, and so on and so forth. Uh, what that saw, uh, what therefore, uh, was uh, the creation of a very narrow elite of oligarchs uh, that became fabulously wealthy uh, that also recognized that uh, their ill-gotten uh, gains uh, were uh, in a country that was unstable, uh, were derived by processes that uh, did not uh, look particularly legitimate uh, to most of the citizens of that country, and therefore could be easily reversed. Now, if you were in a position of having gotten to be a billionaire or a multimillionaire on the basis of your connections to the Russian state that allowed you to gain access to some lucrative enterprise that got you enormous millions, but you knew that uh, it was only a matter of time until uh, a government would be elected that would try to reverse all of that. What would you do? Uh, put my assets into like, some Western country and then... Exactly. Get your money out of the country as quickly as possible. And consequently, there was a massive drain of, of resources out of the country. Uh, and in some cases, uh, quite a few of those that were well-connected um, within the Soviet Union uh, were uh, of Jewish backgrounds. Um, I don't say that as a, as a criticism, but uh, basically uh, one of the features of that was uh, that all those uh, that, were, uh, that, had, uh, that um, uh, were of the Jewish persuasion uh, had an easy out uh, into Israel, uh, insofar as uh, Israel welcomed anyone uh, that wanted to emigrate uh, from Russia uh, into its territory. Uh, and uh, that meant that, that quite a few of those oligarchs escaped uh, from Russia. Uh, some of them remained. Uh, but uh, it's in that context of the rapid privatization and the rather corrupt privatization under the Yeltsin government that that drastic re reduction in the standard of living of most Russian citizens took place and that drastic uh, increase uh, in, or the decrease uh, in life expectancy took place. And it's in that context also uh, that ultimately Vladimir uh, uh, Putin uh, came to power. Now, Vladimir Putin... Uh, came to power not in order to reverse all of this, uh, not because he was a communist that wanted to return the Soviet Union back to communism, but rather because by the time that he came to power, many of those oligarchs that still remained within uh, Russia recognized that the chaos that existed under Yeltsin was a threat to their own stability uh, and essentially uh, looked to uh, Vladimir Lenin uh, to stabilize that situation, uh, to protect them from uh, the kind of instability that might otherwise uh, threaten their wealth. In that regard, Vladimir Putin is not a counterweight uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the uh, oligarchs as a whole, uh, but rather a tool of those oligarchs. 
uh, that meant, uh, nonetheless, uh, that in order to stabilize uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the Russian state, uh, he did have to take actions against at least some of those, uh, those uh, oligarchs, especially those uh, that were control in control of uh, the um, uh, oil and uh, gas reserves uh, within, um, uh, within Russia. Uh, in that context, uh, the uh, Russian state rapidly uh, regained control uh, over uh, those resources uh, through the uh, oil companies and the gas company, Gazprom, and so on, uh, that uh, were once again uh, held uh, in uh, the hands of the state. Uh, and that allowed uh, Russia uh, to uh, rather rapidly uh, recover uh, its um, economic well-being, uh, to restore uh, the services to many of its citizens, uh, and to gradually increase its life expectancy. Uh, it's on that basis of that rather rapid uh, reconstruction uh, of uh, the uh, Russian economy and the restoration of the standard of living of large segments of the, Russians, uh, the Russian uh, population uh, that Vladimir Putin rather predictably became enormously popular uh, and remains enormously popular uh, within, uh, within Russia itself. Uh, but, of course, uh, in the process of uh, becoming uh, a successful president and rather popular on the basis of those policies, he certainly did step on some important toes. Uh, and I would not want to uh, downplay his authoritarian tendencies. Uh, his background uh, was within the KGB uh, uh, under the Soviet Union, and he's certainly, in that sense, not a committed Democrat. Uh, but a rather efficient uh, um, administrator uh, and somebody that did bring some logic back into uh, the Russian uh, policy-making apparatus. Uh, it is now 6.46, uh, and consequently, I feel that I've probably overstayed my welcome here once again. Uh, and uh, I, while I have not completely finished off uh, the uh, discussion of Russian foreign policy, and we'll look at Russian foreign policy since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, a bit uh, at the beginning of next class, uh, I figure it's probably best to let you go at this point anyway, uh, unless I hear loud objections uh, from, uh, from the class. Uh, if not, uh, thank you for your attention, uh, and uh, have, a great week have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week uh, for another exciting look at Russian foreign policy uh, before we turn to our next case study. Supervisor, uh, if you want my input on uh, on your project, I'd be more than happy to, to, to help you out with that. But, but I don't think I can be the official supervisor. Uh, you could ask. Uh, you could, uh, probably the person to ask about that would be Norma in the political science department. You can't cross over. Okay. Uh, well, again, uh, uh, if, yes. If you were doing it in the history department, you would have to find a supervisor in the history department. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't have, uh, can't have, uh, ask me for advice uh, on your research project, and that I can't, you know, give you some pointers as far as that goes. But I, no, I certainly can't, uh, can't supervise it. Next couple, so each Thank <laughs> you.